Yeah, so I'm Simon Bramford uh, from the University of Birmingham, but today I'm talking as an easy build maintainer about our plans for easy build five and how that will impact the community and how the community contribute. Um, this talk will cover changes, policy changes. Yes, we're looking, well, policy changes might imply in some places that we had policies. This might actually be a good indication we're going to write something down so we can work with them. Um, it's also going to give you background to why we're making decisions and changes. And like I said, tell you how you can uh, contribute. What you'll also see bottom right hand corner, as I've nicely highlighted here, there'll be um, an information box or information boxes. Yes, as I've said, uh, at the bottom right hand corner, there'll be um, a box. This one's nicely labeled information and other slides. It will be labeled other things such as. Sorry, I'm hearing myself back here. Yeah. Okay, I'm um, sorry, yeah. Um, red one, breaking changes. Um, that will be a change to how easy build works. These are ones that will might, well, might impact you, they might not impact you at all. And um, which features you're using and not using. I will get to a few of those. Enhancement, a new feature. Those are entirely in, um, designed to make using easy build better or easier. Um, and, the bottom one, green ones, the code cleanups, code enhanced or changes, and you shouldn't see any impact from those. Well, maybe not quite. If you contribute, it might make your contributions easier. Um, and it might make easy build run faster if we clean up a bit of code in places. Uh, status types. So we've got some, some things that we have ideas about um, when we... Yeah, um, sorry, I <laughs> saw a message pop up on the screen. <laughs> Um, those will be things where we're desiring feedback. We will talk a bit more about, or I will talk a bit more about how we want feedback. There's plan changes. These are things where we already know what we want to do. We just need to get on and do it. And the really good one is I've already been working on some things and there are some things that have already been implemented. Um, that's available for testing. And I have built something with Easy Build 5, the development branch thereof. Um, um, as Kenneth mentioned, easy build major versions, 2012 to version one, you can see about two and a half, three years between versions. So we do look a little bit overdue for a major version. And we've had a new logo in there, but Kenneth's already talked about that. <laughs> um, so general information. Yes, there will be breaking changes. Um, we're going to try and minimize them as much as possible. But yes, some things will break, um, hopefully not too many. Um, we're going to give you a, a deprecation warning. So um, we've already been deprecating things that we're looking to remove for Easy Build 5. And similarly, some of the changes we will make will be, this will be deprecated in Easy Build 6 um, to give you time that by the time we get there, and you, know, you can probably guess that's another three years into the future. Um, you'll need to have made a change. So most of the things that are going to be breaking changes in Easy Build 5 are going to be things we've already been uh, warning you about. And there will be documentation. We've already started to draft PR with what we are changing or what we have already changed. There's not very much detail, I don't think, in it yet. No, kind of shaking his head. I haven't contributed yet to that. It's on my to-do list, but I had to write this talk instead. Uh, <laughs> so... Some things change default configuration. We're going to enable trace by output. Um, sorry, by default. Um, this is for the output from Easy Build. What we sort of talked about about uh, maintainers is nearly every maintainer, I think, has this enabled by default. Um, and realize that whenever we, we, we try and debug something else is, who isn't using it, we always look there, look a little bit confused as to what the output is, why it's not giving as so much information. Um, there's some changes to Python package installs, which is basically some things that you're now having to specify in easy configs. You'll be able to take out now if they're the default. And so the defaults will change um, the other way around. Um, another one is we'll run the prepare step before the source step. This will allow you to use some forms of build tools or something similar to build tools to do unpacking. This will be fairly much for non-standard, so you'll still need a tar 
Untara, probably an unzipper, but say something like something to unra, that would probably be able to supply that by easy build instead. There is sort of a bootstrapping thing there. You have to have at least one method of unpacking to be able to unpack the first thing you need to build. Um, and we're changing to Slurm as the default end, uh, job engine. And one that's, you know, a definite enhancement, don't run the sample checks in the installation directory. Make sure they're running a completely separate directory so you don't leave a bunch of artifacts in there. Um, code cleanup. We've already, in, this is one of the implemented features. The support for YAML easy config, YAML based easy configs has been removed. It hadn't had any updates, no real use, nobody asking for features for it, nobody looking to implement features. So we've removed that. Um, and the other one is because our Python is removing disk utils at some point in the future, we are removing, we're obviously having to remove that use directly. And um, so for the loose version, we've moved that inside easy build, the relevant bit. For other bits of disk utils, we still need to do is that work out exactly what we're using and what we need to change. So this is the one that Kenneth has already spoiled. Um, Python 2, this is entirely for what Python is used to run easy build itself. Um, as Kenneth said, and this is based off the user survey, Python 2 use has gone down. Python 2, the how problematic removal has gone down. We deprecated earlier this year. We've been making warning noises for longer than that that we would like to get rid of it. Um, there, also, what versions of Python 3? Um, we worked out from the user survey that it seems like nobody's using Python 3.5. Um, we've been end of life for two and a half years. The problematic one, obviously, is Python 3.6. It's already end of life for a year, but Mainly, we would say because we quite see quite a lot of Red Hat based systems, and that's the default at the moment for at least uh, uh, version eight. Um, so, version eight of the sort of Red Hat based systems. 53% um, of our users are on that. So, um, this is next slide is probably not going to be too much of a surprise. We're going to drop support for Python 2 and 3.5. So we will be able to use features that only in Python 3.6 or greater. Um, this will allow us code simplification. In fact, this is one of the things I've already implemented, and it does. No more indirect use of this Py 2 versus 3, at least in the central repo. Um, there, it makes things a lot easier. You now know exactly what, fe what Python feature you're actually calling rather than this indirect method of not really understanding why easy build has this feature the actual Python library. Um, you will not be able to use Python 2 as a command, as a, py, a valid Python command considered by EB. And because of um, what is used by various systems, the Python is often still um, actually Python 2. Um, we're going to favor the Python 3 as the command over Python. That's particularly relevant for that large chunk of CentOS 7 users where Python 2 would be what is actually labeled as Python or what you get with Python. This is where we start going into an idea and we're trying to work out exactly what we want to do. It has some impact from what Kenneth talked about um, from uh, sorry, a number of open PRs. It's mainly about easy configs, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of what tool chains we're supporting centrally. One of the things that we sort of mention, but we haven't, we never really say exactly what it means, is we provide the central repository of easy configs as a sort of a reference library. We're not intending it to be the one stop shop for every easy config that exists. We're expecting sites to build on top of it. There's quite a, that link there tells you, you know, one of the ways of setting it up. And one of the things we're sort of going to look to going towards is trying to go back to what we, we talk about it every now and again is that inside a tool chain, trying to keep one version of a, soft, a piece of software in there, not have multiple of the same software in a tool chain. But I do say there will be exceptions. 
um, but we're probably going to try and make them more exceptional than we are at the moment um, there. What we're also considering, and this is one of the bits, definitely has the idea flag on it, um, is that for the central repository, we will only accept PRs for recent tool chains. Um, I'm using an example here based on 2023, and I'm the first suggestion we have is that it will be two years back. So for if 2023, we'll go back for 2022A, 2022 and 2021 tool chains. We will deprecate one further back than that, so 2020 tool chains, both the A and the B, and anything older will get archived. Um, which will then be that the older software that we haven't got to merging PRs from, we would then just start closing at that point. Um, one of the reasons we're going for this is while we do use semantic versioning for easy build versions, the tool chains are very much a year based concept. And we're sort of separating out the two that we're going to deprecate tool chains in some way that is based on the year rather than waiting for a major version because as we've seen major versions three years apart maybe four years apart um we don't really want to force out a major version just to deprecate tool chain um so there however we inside the maintainers we had a discussion about this and we already have at least two alternatives if not more um possibly and you'll see, because I already talked about maybe basing on 2023, but actually there's no 2023 tool chain out yet. We have, you know, and we haven't really started one. Um, I haven't really considered it yet. Um, so maybe it will be referred to as the last, however many common tool chains. So maybe six, maybe seven, you know, numbers at the moment are part mainly where the idea is here. We haven't quite decided, or maybe that we'll go one more back on the year, so it'll be uh, 2023 minus three, so back to 2022 as being the last one we're supporting. Um, and then, like I said, yeah, we'll then close, um, we'll also then discourage um, PRs backporting new versions of software into older tool chains, particularly when all that I need to do is just change the what tool chains mentioned and the dependencies. Um, what we might do with those things like this is encourage it it's still to be a PR, but a PR that gets closed quite quickly with a, we're not going to merge this, but we'll, you know, it's useful for it to be here because some other people might want it. Um, there. And I'll sort of mention that a few times is it's to do with balancing the maintainer effort um, and how much time we're taking and making the process quicker. <laughs> um, which is something we're sort of conscious of, which will help us then merge more. As particularly if you see that, you know, all those graphs of how many software packages that we were talking about earlier, that there's just, you know, more and more and more. Um, the next idea, and this talk about module tools, kind of touched on this quickly. Um, our, we've deprecated in Easy Build 4, our mod 6 and Six is deprecated, it might be seven as well. No, is it just six? Um, set up. I couldn't quickly work out when six was last released, any part, any six version was last released, or when it was first released. Um, I got too lost looking through release notes trying to work it out. But I can tell you seven was last released in 2019, so we can probably guess that six was a long time before that. Um, if you're on sort of a Red Hat based, then Apple has 8.7 something for all of those, all the uh, supported versions, 7, 8, and 9. However, Ubuntu doesn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're, 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 yeah. Uh, we're just having a discussion in the room because, yes, we're hoping that this will get solved at some point. You know, there are packages that can be installed, I think. Um, but they're, yeah, um, yeah, that's what we're just trying to be. But they're not there by default. Um, we will 
put this out as an idea. But one of the things we're not quite sure about is we're not quite sure. There's no feature reason for us to drop support for six and seven. It's just motivating the community to use a newer version that generally works a bit better than the older versions, it's generally a bit faster. There's a couple of new features that are quite nice to have if you maybe want to use them, but they're not required and we work around them. So we're not quite sure we're going to discuss and open that one up for you know, the community to talk about. Um, in things that are planned, we are going to change the run function, which is something that sits behind how Easy Build actually does the installation. And having over time, these have just basically, you know, anything like this, it was nice, there was a reason for it, but then somebody goes, oh, I need to do this extra thing and bolt something on. And then they, you know, something else gets bolted on. And then after a while you work out that the default thing that everything's now doing looks nothing like what it first did. So everything seems to be an exception to how you're trying to use this function. Um, and it always seems backwards to what you expect it to be. Um, so the aim is we're going to push out, write a new one that hopefully works better, hopefully works more directly, hopefully allows us better access to error logs, which um, I'll come to and talk to a bit more. Um, but the aim is here that you'll still be able to use the old versions, but that will deprecate them in the uh, Easy Build 5. So by 6, everybody will need to have moved over to using the new one. Um, but there'll be some method that makes it not painful when you get to Easy Build 5 if you're using it directly. Um, I was wondering if it's <laughs> Um, sorry, so do we want to call run CMD uh, a 20 headed monster? <laughs> yeah, it might well be the case of calling it a 20 headed monster. I, it's, I know I've tried to debug, a, debug how to, well, I've tried to add better error reporting to easy build or better error passing of the logs. And I got so lost as to where I needed to add it into the um, mix that I had to stop and go, well, actually, I need to revert back and start again. So yeah, something that's better and um, the more of us understand, the more of us can use, um, or more of us can edit, sorry. Um, and that's, you know, back to maintain ref, but if nobody really understands it, who can actually edit the code? <clears throat> As I said, error reporting and logs. Um, these are sort of improving the log files is actually a function of probably we want better error reporting because you're probably only looking in the, in the log files because the error report is not always great. Unfortunately, builds will fail. I wish they didn't, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, if we could solve that, that would actually take <laughs> out it. But that, that's what sometimes it looks like trying to chase down errors, um, untangling the tape. Um, so we, are, we have definitely have planned here definitely have plans is make it more obvious what the log files were, make it more obvious what command was being run when something went wrong, um, and hopefully build in, and this was the bit I was trying to get to go, it's context aware reporting that, you know, if you're doing configure make, it will go and look in the configure log if the um, configure.log if the configure fails, and also pattern matching, because there are tools out there that already do some of this pattern matching, and we just need to hook them in better. Or hook them in. So yeah, John. <laughs> so John has raised the let's just um, basically let's just upload the report. Yeah, we, we we're considering that. Um, we want to balance. Yeah, well, it saves a step. The question becomes. Who's going to debug it? You know, we don't want every single report uploaded because there'll just be so much noise that we never look at them. So it's that balance between making sure we are, it's only done at a certain point. And that's one of the questions we have is that balance as to when. And I'm far raising here. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> So, so Bart's talking about the if it fails, then we want to be in the shell. So I've sort of left this out of this slide and actually the previous slide. It was in our, my earlier notes, but 
yes, the being able to drop into a shell if it fails or being dropped into the shell when it fails, yes. It's a very good idea. I'm not sure how we get that to work. Uh, uh, and I don't want to be promising it in terms of EG Build 5, but I would definitely love it. But I would you know, need to find somebody who can work out how we would implement that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, but Kenneth's comment was yes, we're going to you know, build that as a possibility. You know, it's, if it's in the ports when we're designing a random function, then hopefully it will be possible to work out how we do that or how we hook that type of functionality in. Um, idea, um, and this one, this, this is something that sort of we seem to go back and forth with about us to going in different directions as to whether we want to add more and more stuff to the base R and uh, an easy configs or whether we want to make them as bare as possible and put everything into a different easy config. And different sites I know have different solutions for this. Um, why we will talk with um, community. One of the reasons we were considering the bare is having this uh, bare as the base is particularly for Python, and actually I haven't mentioned Perl on here, but Perl is probably there, is we have them as build dependencies in several places. And having this, not having a separate build dependency for Perl and Python as the version that you then actually use, so you just reuse it at some point. Um, but there are bits there as to, you know, if we are going to do this, how do we decide, particularly for the R, which is now over a thousand packages in the um, central repository main R, easy company. Who gets to decide how we split them up or who is going to decide how we split them up? Um, but probably, and one thing, well, one thing I want from it, if we do do it, is the, how do we, uh, I want one package that still looks like the old one, but that's just my laziness, because I just want to tell my users, just go and load that now. Um, <laughs> easy configs, there's a few um, ideas for sort of improvements. When specifying a tool chain, we currently specify name and, uh, I, we specify the name that it's called and version that it's there. We're proposing, or I'm proposing at least, a simpler option of just having some sort of tuple of, well, you just say it's Fosun 2022A. You know, you don't need to say that the first thing is the name and the second thing is the version because everybody writes them in that order as far as I know. Um, and particularly also is we can probably then add the tool chain ops in there as a dictionary or something similar for the times there. Um, there, this one I definitely want. Um, and there, partly because whenever somebody comes up, this is the when you have a Python module or R, and it but it's let me it's sanity check for import is it might be called well PyTorch, you know, PyTorch is the module name, but the you import it as torch. Um I can never remember that syntax. And whenever anybody asks how do I do this, I have to go and you know search the repository, find an example, and then go, you need to do this. Um so something simpler and more direct for that. Um, <clears throat> there. Uh, some other options and ideas. One is to make, I'm going back to the top, uh, sorry, bottom to the top, module class not required. So you can decide whether you actually want to use module classes. Um, this is probably coming from me because I know my site, we completely ignore module classes. Um, because about 50% of our easy configs are by in bio. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's not a great and useful category to us. So, um, you know, there. Another thing, and we think we should be getting better at is having easy configs specify what, license, what software license is. Like, you know, is it GPL or whatever else and what version? And we think that would be quite useful. Particularly then also, sites could decide if sites are this way minded that I'm not going to install anything that isn't a certain type of license or certain permissiveness of license. Um, and also potentially a method to specify conflicts. Um, we see this sometimes with components that you can have two modules that actually should be saying that they're conflicting because they provide different versions of a default library, but actually because of the way that's hidden inside somewhere, 
it doesn't tell you quite that they, uh, you know, you can actually load them at the same time and then not know which version of that library you're actually going to get work uh, or not work or both of them not work. Um, the documentation side, Kenneth mentioned, this isn't really easy to build five directly, but just that, you know, we've launched it, done that, look about the yearly review and the integration of the tutorial into it, you know, make it a bit um, more joined up. So how can you contribute? We're going, we're forming a working group. And this is for people who want to get involved with the coding, the reviewing, the testing, the writing documentation. There is a Slack channel for it in our Slack, EV5. Um, we're going to be having monthly meetings, first Wednesday of the month at 2 central uh, European time. <laughs> Not in my time zone, so I need to translate it already. And those are obviously the first four meetings and more, if, more depending on the progress as to how well we're doing. <laughs> progress and timeline. We are aiming for this year for a release. Um, we will see how there. There is a GitHub project board for it. Um, you will find Git Easy Build Five labels and milestones across the repositories. They're already there. The, as I said, the 5.0.x five, 5 branches are there. You can test from them. I have used them to install. It's mainly stuff I've done at the moment, but you can go and have a look and see what's being done. Um, as I said, we will be collating feedback on ideas. It's likely to be in the form of these ideas that I've raised. So I'll specifically ask, don't try and talk to me during this easy build user meeting. Please, when we ask for them, when I've sort of coherently done it, add the feedback then. This is mainly because if you talk to me in the next couple of days while I'm busy organizing, I will, I will remember that somebody talked to me about it, but I will have forgotten what you've said. <laughs> um, so what, what, what will happen is, one of the maintainers will post on uh, one of the GitHub repositories. We haven't quite decided which one. An issue, probably a GitHub issue with this is the proposal. We will then notify from the mailing list and the general channel in Slack and say, for the next probably four weeks, this proposal is open. Please go and discuss this as to where you think we should go for these things. So there'll be one for the tool chain support policy. There'll be one about our mods. There'll be, and then there's some others, and we need to decide what we're going to, you know, which ones we'll write up. But we will let people know and then ask for feedback. Um, one observation I do have the survey is our main way of knowing what our users are doing or how they're using Easy Build. So hopefully it's accurate, hopefully it's a good snapshot but please do fill it in because that's how we know what systems we're trying to support. Um, there. And questions. And that's where, that's a list of where all my um, pictures have come from. Not very many questions though, because it's nearly time for the next talk. <laughs> ah. We'll have a, have a discussion slot on Wednesday as well. But Casper um, has a question. Yeah, so that one version that is that different from what we're doing now? What the benefits of the project? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we're going to make it a clearer policy I, because I think it's definitely the maintainers. And this is about what Kenneth talked about. Um, so the question was about over one version per tool chain. Um, so Kenneth mentioned things like there have been 50 new contributors this year. I know it is a maintainer, you know it's a maintainer, probably several of our long-term contributors know it, but I'm not sure we've written it down anywhere in the documentation. Um, and so there are things like that, yeah, where we want to make sure it's clear there's a policy um, and why you know, write some justifications to why and explain it so we can go, this is why we're doing this and this is the reasoning. Um, and then let people know where to put effort and things like that. Um, 